opportunity to shake your hand after the service today. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and turn toward the end of the chapter. It's a a long chapter. It's 58 verses. And we're going to start in verse number 50 and then we'll work our way through uh, the end of the chapter there. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, we're going to dub this as uh, uh, Bible Prophecy Month. And so, Lord willing, every Sunday morning, I'm going to be bringing a message on prophecy, Bible prophecy, and those things that you and I can look forward to in the end times. And, and, and so, we're going, to, we're going to begin that today. And so, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 50, when you find your place, if you'll stand out of respect for the reading of God's Word, if you're able to stand. And let's read, start in verse number 50. The Bible says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Look at verse 51. Uh, Paul is speaking to the church of Corinth here, and he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, what's that talking about? Behold, I show you a mystery. Well, a mystery in the New Testament is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament. Uh, it was it was something of a mystery, but something that the Holy Spirit was was revealing in in the New Testament. So that's what Paul is saying when he said, "Behold, I show you a mystery." This is something that they did not previously understand, but something that the Holy Spirit is giving us understanding on. So he says, "We shall not all sleep," and that word "sleep" is the idea of someone that has deceased. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory, O death, Where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. In other words, if you and I die in our sin, there's a definite sting. And the Bible says that the law reveals that to us. That's what it means. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. We buried mom Monday. But the sting was gone. The sting was gone because mom was ready. And that's what the Bible's saying there. But look at verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You may be seated this morning, and I want to talk to you about God's prophetic calendar uh, for the end times. And so let's go to the Lord, and we're going to talk about just one of those today, just one of those topics. And so let's go to the Lord and ask the Lord to help us. And uh, I I promise I'm not going to preach very long this morning. And so, uh, boy, let's do our best to just uh, give us our undivided attention today. Father, we love you, and thank you so much. What a service. Lord, what a what a place and what a God. And Lord, we thank you so much for your bountiful blessings upon us. And Lord, you're just so good. You're so good to us. And we just praise you. God, thank you for giving us the roadmap. Lord, this divine, supernatural roadmap of life called the Bible. And I pray that you'll bless our discussion this morning. I pray for the power and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that what we say will please you. And I pray what we say will be interesting And I pray, Heavenly Father, for those that may be lost and undone without Christ, that this would be the day of their salvation. This would be the day they would accept Christ as personal Savior. I pray, Lord, that you might bind the powers of darkness and keep them away from this place. And I pray that you keep your blessings within. God, help us and be with us, please. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. And all the Lord's people said, amen. God's prophetic calendar of events concerning the end times. Basically, there are eight. There are eight events that we can expect and eight events that if the Lord allows us to do this, we're going we're, we're to deal with 
here at the church. Let me give you those eight events. Number one, the rapture of the church. Number two, the seven years of tribulation on the earth. Number three, the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the second coming, what we call the second coming of Christ. Number six, the millennial reign of Christ. Number seven, the great white throne judgment. And last of all, what we would call eternity in heaven. The Bible says that there's going to be new heavens and there's going to be a new earth. And we're going to talk about what that actually means. But the one that I want to deal with today is actually the next event on God's prophetical calendar, and that is the rapture of the church, the rapture of the church. So it was September the 30th, 1882, when a pile of steamer by the name of the Robert E. Lee left out of its port and it was traveling from, uh, from down the Mississippi River from Vicksburg, Mississippi to New Orleans, Louisiana. There were hundreds of people on board the Robert E. Lee. And unbeknownst to the pastors, at around 3 o'clock that morning, the boat caught fire. And so the captain, realizing that, uh, got his first mate. And he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go down. And he said, I want you to start in the saloon. And then he said, I want you to go from door to door. And he said, I want you to start notifying people that the boat is on fire and that they're going to need to get up to try to save their life. No time to make explanations. Just go and bang on the doors, get people awake, and we're going to have to get them off the boat. The story said this, that oddly enough, many responded by becoming angry, that they were awakened out of their sleep, angry. Uh, others said that they just laughed when the first mate came and knocked on the door and, and uh, went through the saloon and said the, that the, the boat's on fire, that many just laughed. And then there were a number of people who just simply could not believe that what he said was true. They did not believe that the boat was on fire. But sure enough, it was on fire. And that night, 21 people perished. They burned to death. And partly because when the first mate knocked on their door or tried to get them to evacuate, they just did not believe that the boat was on fire. In a very similar way, the world acts as if eschatology, which is the study of the end times, they believe that eschatology is nothing to be concerned about. They act as if it may not happen. It might and it might not happen. I'm going to be quite honest with you, not trying to start out in a controversial way, but I'm going to be honest with you. Most people are living like it's not going to happen. Right. Most Christians are living like it's not going to happen. They sort of believe in the back of their mind, you know what, that preacher, you know what he's saying, you know what, uh, okay, pastor, uh, it, you know what, it, it might happen, you know, and it might happen like you say, but, but it might not. And I'm just telling you, church, if we ever get to the place where we really believe what I'm going to preach this morning, it will change your life forever. It really will. And so I want to talk to you about the rapture of the church today. Several just very, very simple, simple uh, message today, several points that I want to draw at. First of all, I want you to notice that the rapture of the church will involve time, time. Now, you say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Let, let, let me answer a question. When will the rapture take place? It's a good question. And a lot of people want to know that question. When will the rapture take place? Two things I want to say. The first one is this, the timing of the rapture is imminent. It's imminent. So just, just a few days ago, literally just a few days ago, I was on the phone with a gentleman, not, doesn't attend our church, but I was on the phone with a gentleman, he's an older fella, and uh, we were talking about, uh, we we're talking about the end times, and he said, well, he said, I know this. He said, I know that the rapture won't be in my lifetime. And uh, when he said that, it sort of caught me off guard. I know, he said, that the rapture won't be in my lifetime because before the rapture can take place, some things have to happen. And I thought, you know what? That's not right. It's not right at all. That's why it's so important that you and I study the Word of God because when we study God's Word and study to show ourselves approved, we understand something. We understand that, yes, there are some things that must happen before Jesus sets up his kingdom on the earth. For instance, we know according to the book of Daniel 
that the tribulation is a set amount of days. We know the tribulation period is going to be just a little over seven years. We know this. We know before, before the second coming of Christ, we know that there will be something called the abomination of desolation. The Bible tells us that. And the Antichrist is going to set himself up as God to be worshipped. And the abomination of desolation, we know this. We know before the, 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 the second coming of Christ, or at least before Jesus will set up his kingdom on the earth, that the Antichrist will be put down. We understand that 144,000 Jewish preachers and soul winners will spread the gospel around the earth. And we also know, according to the Scripture, that during the tribulation period, the temple will be rebuilt. But I said all that to say this, Calvary, there's something that it's important for us to understand. The rapture of the church is imminent. It's imminent. Now you say, Pastor, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that if you are waiting on a sign that the rapture is going to come, you're not going to get it. There's not one solitary thing that has to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church takes place. It is imminent, imminent. Now, you say imminent, preacher. What, what, what does that even mean? That word imminent literally means overhanging, overhanging. Have you ever done this? Have you ever been out to, uh, maybe you were uh, having a picnic with your family or you were out at the ball field and you were playing ball or something and all of a sudden these black clouds, these low clouds begin to roll in and, and, uh, and you thought, man, these, these overhanging clouds rolled in and you thought, you know what? It could rain any moment. I mean, the wind starts blowing and the clouds are getting worse and worse and you're thinking, man, uh, rain could be, it could be imminent. That's exactly what that word means. It means that the coming of the Lord is imminent. Now, church, listen to me. We may have open house down here tonight. We may not. We might have open house in heaven. I mean, we're talking about giving tours down here, brother. We might get the grand tour of all tours tonight. Because Jesus Christ could come today. And by the way, I want to say this. No man knows the day. So his name was William Miller. And uh, he predicted, he was the original founder of the Seventh-day Adventist, and he originally predicted that the coming of the Lord would happen in 1843. In fact, April the 3rd. He said April the 3rd, 1843, the Lord is going to come. And people begin to listen to his message, and he, he, he gathered quite the following. 50 to 100,000 people begin to listen to uh, William Miller. And he said, on April the 3rd, 1843, Jesus is coming again. Well, you know what those, those Millerites did? They, they believed what he said. And so they said that some of them uh, climbed up to the mountaintops so they could get a head start on everybody else. Some of them went to the graveyard so they could be resurrected with their loved ones. Others went outside of town so they could uh, be away from uh, society when the Lord came. Here's the sad part about that story. April 3rd came, and April 3rd went, and April 4th came, and April 4th went, and Jesus didn't come. And so William Miller, you know what he did? He said, well, I missed it the first time, and so I'm going to predict it again. So he predicted it again, another date, and guess what happened? The Lord didn't come. And he predicted yet another date and another date, and the Lord didn't come. Now you say, preacher, why is that? And I'll tell you why. Because no man knows the day, and no man knows the hour. Listen to Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this that if the goodman of the house had known and watched the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Now, church, if you don't get anything else out of this message today, this is what you need to understand, that the rapture of the church is imminent. It's overhanging. And by the way, if you can look at what's going on in our world today and believe that it's not soon, You've got some problems. 
I mean, brother, listen, if there's ever been a time when it seems like everything's lining up and the stage is being set, I believe it is today. So the timing is imminent, but listen to this. The timing of the rapture will not only be imminent, the timing of the rapture will be instantaneous. It'll be instantaneous. Now look back at your Bible again, 1 Corinthians 15, and I want you to pay special close attention to verse number 52. Look what our Bible teaches here. Verse 52 in a, notice the words, in a what? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In a moment. Now, I've studied out the twinkling thing, but I don't know that I ever studied out that other word. The word, the Bible says in a moment. It is the, it is the Greek word atomos. Atomos. A-T-O-M-O-S, atomos. You've heard this, an atom of time. It means, it literally means that which cannot be cut in two. Indivisible. That's how fast the rapture of the church is gonna take place in an atom of time. I mean, it's gonna be so fast you can't split it. It's going to be so fast, you can't think. The Bible says not only in a moment, but it goes on to describe it this way, in the twinkling of an eye. It is the Greek word ripe, or uh, R-H-I-P-E, and it means a jerk of the eye. And it literally means this church, that the rapture of the church is going to be faster than the deployment of a vehicle's airbag. Now, again, I've used this before, but I studied this out a little further. Did you know the experts tell us that when you're in an accident and your, your airbag, airbags deploy, that they deploy in somewhere between 10 to 20 milliseconds. That's how fast they come out. So when I read that, I thought, okay, <laughs> inquiring minds want to know, amen, and simple minds especially. And I thought, okay, 10 milliseconds, what does that even mean? What is a millisecond? And so I looked this up. Listen to this. 10 milliseconds in seconds is equal to 0.01 seconds. Now you say, preacher, what's the big deal? I'm telling you, that's a big deal. Because that tells us something that the rapture of the church is going to happen instantaneously. Instantaneously. So all these people will say, well, you know what? If that preacher's right, if he's telling the truth, i tell you what I'll do. As soon as the rapture takes place, I'll run down to the church and talk to the preacher. You won't talk to this preacher because this preacher won't be here. And as far as I know, most of the other preachers in the church, they won't be here either. But I'm telling you, if you could come and talk to the preacher, you won't have time. If you could, listen, you won't have time to make it to the church. You won't have time to call the church. You won't even have time to think about the church. I'm telling you, the rapture will happen in 0.01 seconds before you know what happens, before this world even realizes what has happened. It is over. No time to repent. No time to read a gospel track. No time to call a prayer helpline. No time to, you know, somebody says, but, but, but pastor, what I'll do is I'll fall on my knees and I'll call out to Jesus. Friend, you won't have time to even think about it. By the time you get to your knees, it's over. And so understand that the rapture of the church will involve time. Listen to this next one. Number two, the rapture of the church will involve trumpets. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, the church, you'll notice I didn't say trumpet. I believe the rapture of the church is gonna involve trumpets, plural. I believe there's gonna be at least two. Look back at your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52. The Bible says that in a moment, atomos, in, a, in the atom of, uh, atom of time, in the twinkling of an eye, at the, notice the words, at the, what's it say? At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the Bible says the last trump. Now, you know what that implies? There's a first trump. 
Now, there are some who try to take that scripture and they try to twist it around and say, see there, that means we're going out mid-trib. We're not going out pre-trib. We're, the church is not gonna leave until midways through the tribulation period that the trumpet judgments are gonna be sounding on the earth and, and about midway through the tribulation, the church is gonna be called out. But I want you to understand something, that there's nothing, there's nothing synonymous about the trumpet at the rapture and the trumpet judgments, nothing. But this is what I believe, and this is what a lot of scholars believe, that the first trumpet will resurrect the dead. And so... Give me some good sound back there, Alan. I'm not saying this is what it's going to be like, but this may be what you'll hear. You say, what's that about, Pastor? I believe that this is what's going to happen. That first trumpet's going to sound, and those that are deceased, my mom, who we put in the grave just the other day, your mom, or dad, or a little child, or whatever the case may be, who knew the Lord, that first trumpet will sound, and those that are redeemed, those that are, are deceased, and they have went on to be with the Lord, the Bible says that their bodies are going to be resurrected, and they're going to receive a new body, the Bible says. But then we're going to... Come on now, church. We're going to hear a last trump. We're going to hear a last trump. You say, preacher, who's that one for? That's for you and that's for me right there. Hey, I'm telling you, on the first one, Mama's going home. On the first one, Granny's going home. But I got some great news on the last one. I'm going home, amen. And so are you. Hey, there's gonna be the sound of a trumpet. The last trumpet will sound, calling those alive away. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You say, preacher, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it's gonna happen. And I just wanna tell you in an atom of time after it happens, you'll become a believer. But you will have missed it. And so the rapture of the church will involve involve time. The rapture of the church will involve trumpets. Oh, listen, you're gonna like this one. The rapture of the church will involve transformation. Some of you need this one this morning. Look at your Bible again, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. This is so good. And you know what, here's the thing too, the Lord just says it over and over and over. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We're not all gonna be deceased. We're not all gonna be put in the grave. Not all are looking for the undertaker. Some are looking for the upper taker. We shall not all sleep. Oh, look at this church. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And here he says it again. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You know what that's teaching us? that some are going to be alive for the rapture. I'm gonna be honest, I hope it's me. And I hope it's you for that matter. Listen, I, I listen. thank God for the undertakers and they did a great job with mom uh, this week and we're very thankful for their work and their service and their, their ministry. But I'm telling you church, I'm not looking for the undertaker, I'm looking for the upper taker. And his name is Jesus. 
And so some will be alive for the rapture. Some will be deceased when the rapture occurs. The Bible tells us that. We just read it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But here's what I want you to understand. Whether you are alive or you are deceased, all are going to be transformed. All are. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed, changed, changed. You say, preacher, what does that mean? It's the Greek word alasso. And it means to make different. But there's another definition. It means to exchange one thing for another thing. Boy, don't you love exchanging old stuff for new stuff? Cell phones are just part of our culture now. And sometimes that cell phone gets cracked and scratched and dim and it doesn't work, you know, it doesn't work good, especially if you have an Android. It doesn't, doesn't work good, but, you know, and <laughs> sorry about that. But, but, you know, it's a blessing when you think, you know what? Man, I'm due for an upgrade. And you go over there to the phone store, and, and man, you've got this old, you know, you've got this old flip phone. It looks like something Captain, Captain Kirk used on Star Trek or something. And, 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 man, they've got this new, I mean, brand new thing. And, I mean, it's just, it does everything. I mean, it cranks your car. It turns up your heat. I mean, it calls the dog. I mean, it does everything. And, and you, you, you trade in that old flip. You trade that in for this brand new, brand new cell phone. Man, what a big deal. Or even better than that. Have you ever traded in your old house for a new house? Man, you'd been living there for a long, long time, or maybe your house was sort of sort of dilapidated and going downhill, and and you saved and you saved and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed, and finally that house, that dream house, uh, came uh, came up, and and uh, you worked with a realtor, and they worked with you, and and sure enough. Man, you were able to move out of that little cracker box of a house and you were able to move into that brand new house and it's got brand new drywall and brand new carpet and man, it's just absolutely beautiful. Hey, you, you know what you did? You traded the old in and you exchanged it for the new. Oh, come on, church. You know what our Bible's teaching us? At the rapture of the church, we're gonna exchange the old for the new. Some of you are about ready to exchange yours in right now. Well, some of you this morning, you know what? Yours is racked with arthritis and rheumatism. You've got all the itis, brothers. I mean, you've got arthritis, bursitis. You've got, uh, man, you just got it all. Some of you, boy, you're members of the Four Eyes Club like I am, and now you've got to have bifocals like I do. And some of you got to have hearing aids, and you've got to have bunions, and you've got to have lifts, and you've got to have all these things. Hey, Calvary, I got some great news. There's coming a day when we will exchange the old in for the new. Man, what a day. What a day. My little mom, when, when mom passed away, it's, you know, so hard because we're, you know, we're sad, but we're glad. Mom, thankfully, mom struggled. With, she struggled with dementia for probably at least two years. But even struggling with dementia, mom knew us. And we could walk in, and mom knew who we were. She didn't remember other things, but she remembered us. Man, that was big. She knew who dad was. And mom did, even with dementia, mom did okay most of that time. But boy, right up about the last two weeks or so, mom got real pitiful. She got real bad. And mom started crying out. And we had to, they had to bring a hospital bed in. And mom uh, my mom was hard. She was hard to deal with. And she, uh, and by that I mean that she just, bless her heart, she just, she was crying out and calling out and, and, and wanting somebody to come and help her. And of course, we were there and dad was there and, and she wanted somebody to come and help her. I'm telling you, church, I got some great news. My mama got some help this week. And one of these days when the trumpet sounds, that first trumpet sounds, my little mama is coming up out of the grave and she's going to get a brand new body. She'll exchange the old in for the new. 
That's the rapture of the church. And so the rapture of the church involves time. The rapture of the church involves trumpets. The rapture of the church involves transformation. Listen to this and we're done. The rapture of the church will involve true believers. Then you say, Pastor, what 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 do you mean? I mean that the rapture of the church is not for everybody. Not everybody's going. One of these days, that trumpet's going to sound. Now, whether it sounds like what I just played, and it probably won't. It'll probably be something more grand than that. But when that trumpet sounds, those that are going to be caught away into the air to meet the Lord are those that are a part of his church, those that are true believers. But let's look at it. I want to show it to you. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. So in this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, and this mortal shall I put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Look at verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. Then somebody says, Pastor, who's the us? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, therefore, my beloved brethren. This is saved people he's talking to. This is those that have have accepted Christ as their personal Savior. They're a part of the brotherhood. They're a part of the brethren. They're a part of the family of God. Those that have come to that place where they realize they're lost and they desperately, desperately need a Savior. It's not about good works. It's not about church membership. It's not about being the the best Baptist in the world. It's not about being the best Catholic in the world. It's not about being the best charismatic in the world. Brother, you you just come to that place where you realize I'm in desperate need of a Savior and you you put your faith and trust in him and and receive him as Savior. And uh, that's who this is talking about, the rat of the church are, is for those people. Well, you say, Pastor, if that's the case, and it is, then are you trying to tell me that, yes, that many will be left behind? In fact, this is just something I believe. We can disagree to, we can agree to disagree on this. This is just personally something I believe. That trumpet that we played for you a moment ago, I don't think the lost will hear it. I think you will hear it if you're redeemed. I don't think they will. And so all of a sudden, in just a moment of time, in in an atom of time, millions will go missing. What are they going to say? Well, folks, it was all true. Those preachers were all telling us the truth. It's all true. They're not going to say that. They won't even say that now. You know what they're going to say? We've been visited by extraterrestrials. <laughs> Mark my words. Aliens have come, and they've taken millions of people away. And so, I, I, so we understand that, that many, many, many are going to be left behind. Now listen to this, and we're done. The idea of the rapture, although a mystery, is really made perfect sense to those who understand Jewish wedding culture. Now listen, and we're done. Listen to this. In Jewish wedding tradition, as the young man becomes of age to marry, he builds a room onto his father's house. So there'll be a place for him and his new bride to live. When the young man is ready to get married, he goes to his father and gets permission to go after his bride. With his father's permission, he goes to collect his bride. She never knows just when he'll come for her, so the bride has to be ready at all times. When he's near her home, a trumpet is sounded to let her know he's there. And with a shout, he calls her out so she can follow him back to the room he's prepared. When they get to his father's house, he keeps her there for seven days. And at the end of those seven days, He goes back to her home and claims to the world his rightful place as a married man. Jesus is in his father's house, and he is building a place. John 14 tells us that. He's building a place for his bride, the church, to live. When God the Father gives permission, Jesus will then come for his bride, 
And when he gets here, a trumpet will sound and a shout will occur to call his bride to him. When we meet him in the air, we shall follow him to his father's house where he keep us for seven years. And at the end of that seven years, Jesus will take us back to earth where he claims to the world his rightful place as king of kings and lord of lords supreme for the rest of eternity. Here's the question. Are you ready? Are you ready? You said, Pastor, I don't believe it's going to happen. I'm telling you, church, it's as sure as this pulpit is right here. It's real. The rapture of the church is coming. And it is imminent. It is overhanging right now. It's overhanging. And that means that it could come at any moment. Are you ready? If you're watching by way of live stream, are you ready? Are you ready? Would you bow your heads with us this morning? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let me ask a, a question or two. Are you ready? Are you ready? We well, say, Pastor, what does, that, what does that mean? If the rapture of the church took place before we even got out of this invitation service, are you ready? If Jesus came today, would you meet him in the air? If that's not the case, friend, today, Sunday, July the 2nd, 2023, ought to be the day that you get ready, that you ought to come to Jesus. How many of you here this morning with heads bowed, heads bowed and eyes closed and you'd say, Pastor, if I died today, July the 2nd, if I died today, I know beyond a shadow of any doubt that I am on my way to that place called heaven. If you can honestly say that as a testimony between you and the Lord, would you just slip your hand up right now, just all over the house. Don't raise it if you can't mean it now. Thank you, you can lower your hands. All right, heads are bowed and eyes are closed and nobody's looking just for a moment. Nobody's looking. Just me, just for a moment. How many are here today though? And you'd say, Pastor, I'm going to be honest. If the Lord came today, I'm just not sure. Oh, preacher, don't misunderstand. I want to be. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. But, Pastor, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. I'm not 100% sure. And I care enough to slip up my hand and let you pray for me right now. If that's you, you just slip your hand up all over the house. Just slip it up and let me pray for you. Can I do that? Can I do that? Can I pray for you? Just raise it real high and wave it at me. Just wave it at me. I see a hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. Amen. Anybody else? Preacher, if I died, I'm not sure I'm ready. Would you pray for me? You'd slip your hand up right now. Anybody else? Come on. Come on, be honest. Can I pray with you? I'm not embarrassed. I just want to pray with you. All right? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask another question. How many of you here today would say, Pastor, I'm saved. I've already raised my hand about that. I can take you back to the time it was a revival or a camp meeting or a radio broadcast or somebody came by my home and witnessed to me or I was in a Sunday morning service. or But... But you say, preacher, I'm saved. I've already raised my hand about that. But if the rapture took place in the next five seconds, I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure as a Christian that I'm really ready to stand before the Lord of Lords. You see, I've not been serving like I ought to serve. I've not been living for the Lord like I ought to live. And yes, pastor, I am saved. But I'm just not so sure that I'm ready to stand before the King of Kings. And I'd like you to pray for me this morning. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking. You just slip your hand up right now and say, Preacher, I need some prayer on that. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Pray for me today. Pray for me. Pray for me. Would you stand with us this morning? Father, we thank you for your blessings. 
And God, I feel like this was the perfect will of God. I feel like this is the direction that you wanted us to go today. Oh, God helps to understand it's coming. The end is coming. I believe it's in sight. Lord, I don't know when. I don't know when. I don't know the day. I don't know the date. I don't know the time. But I believe it's coming soon. Lord, most everybody here today raised their hands about being saved. But I wonder how many of those who raised their hands have loved ones who are lost, lost, lost. And if the rapture took place today, their loved ones would still be here. God, maybe today somebody needs to just tiptoe down to this altar and mention that child or mention that mom, mention that uncle, mention that coworker, that neighbor. Maybe today somebody needs to come and just ask you to open a door that they could have an opportunity to witness and get the gospel to them. Those that need to be saved, I pray that you'd help them to come. Those who need to rededicate their life to Christ, I pray that they will come. God, whatever it might be, maybe someone needs to be baptized. They'd make themselves a candidate for baptism today. Or, God, maybe there are uh, some who are feeling that the Spirit of God is directing them to join with this local body. Whatever it may be, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd work. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed just for another moment or so. And if you need to come, listen, the altars are open. Folks are coming right now. Is there anybody else who just needs to make a move? Somebody you're thinking about right now. Maybe, maybe God put somebody on your heart while the pastor was preaching today. And you're so concerned. And if the rapture took place today, they'd be left behind. Lord, would you open a door? Would you give us the opportunity to witness to them? Would you give me the opportunity to share the gospel with them? Hey, parents, if you've got kids that are lost, oh, man, we better get a burden. While folks are coming, anybody else? Anybody else need to make a move today? Good day, good day to rededicate your life to Jesus. Good day to get on fire for the Lord. If you're here this morning, you've been wandering for a little while. It's a good day to come home. It's a good day to get back in the will of God. Oh, it's a good day. While we pause just for a moment, will you come? Will you come? So, Father, we're thankful for your blessings and thank you for the word of God. And I don't know all that's going on in the altars this morning, but God, I'm glad you do. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work. I pray you'd give these folks the desires of their heart. Father, I feel like quite a few are probably praying for lost loved ones. Oh, God, I pray that you'd open a door. I pray that you'd show their loved one their need of coming to Jesus. God, show them how desperate they are. And I pray that soon and very soon they'll come to know the Lord as their personal Savior. God, have your way in the remainder of the invitation, please. And we sure thank you in Jesus' name. You can look up this way. We're going to sing this little chorus here in just a moment. If you're watching our live stream today, we're, we're so thankful for your attendance today. Listen, there's a number on the bottom of your screen right now, 704-327-5662. And if we can pray with you, please Reach for that phone and dial that number right now. We have some people waiting by the phone, and we want to we wanna pray with you today. If you need to come, the altars are open, and let's sing this together. Ready, church? All to Jesus I surrender. Time. All to 
Lord, is there anybody else? Lord, I really do believe sometimes this is the kind of stuff revival's made out of. God, when we get so consumed that the end is coming, that the rapture is going to take place, and we get so concerned about our loved ones, God, I pray that every parent, God, that you might give them an extra, an extra special burden for their children that are lost or their children that are away from the Lord. God, I pray for those that are praying for mamas and daddies, siblings, grandkids. Nothing more precious than a grandkid. Oh, Lord, I can't imagine going to heaven. My grandkids not being there. I just can't even imagine it. I don't even want to think about it. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd reveal to these their condition. Show them how much they need a Savior. And I pray that soon and very soon they'll come to the Lord. Have your way, please, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Anybody else before we go? All hearts free? Amen. Thank you, fellas. Appreciate that very much. Well, let me tell you some about some good news here. Carson. This is Brother Carson. Amen. Brother Carson, Amen. yeah. And so Luke reached out this week, and he said, Preacher, said God's really God's doing something. And, um, and so we met over here in the office, and we stayed for a little while. And um, Carson... Gave his heart to Jesus hey, this morning. Isn't that great? Amen. Amen. And so sometimes, you know, when uh, younger ones get saved, and, we, and I told him in the office this week, I said, it's two things you need to do. Number one, you need to let me baptize you. And I explained to him what baptism was. And I said, number two, you need to tell everybody. I and mean, just tell everybody that you got saved. But sometimes, well, that baptism, that scares kids a little bit, but not this kid right here. He's ready. He wants to get baptized, Amen. and uh, we might even do it next Sunday. We'll see how things go, but if you rejoice with Carson's decision, say amen. Amen, amen Carson. I'm proud of you, buddy. Amen. amen. Man, that's good. Thank you, Luke. Bless you, buddy. You find Carson and let him know how much you appreciate him. Hey, listen, have a great afternoon. Be sure, Calvary, let's make sure all of our visitors get 10 or 15 handshakes before they leave, and uh, have a good afternoon, and we'll see you tonight, uh, 6 o'clock, don't forget choir practice. And then service will be a little bit abbreviated tonight, and then we'll all migrate down here to the Speace Life Center. And so it's going to be a special, special night. We hope that you'll be with us. Rodney, would you mind coming up and dismiss us today in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we humbly approach our throne of grace, just praising you and thanking you for the day you've given us. 
thank you for the freedom and the opportunity that we had to be in your house this morning. Thank you for your word. And dear God, I pray that you would burden all of our hearts for our lost loved ones. And dear God, we thank you for this precious soul that was saved this week. I pray you'd be with Carson. And I pray that he would glorify you and be with us as we go our separate ways and to bring us back at the next appointed time. Forgive us where we fail thee in these blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We consider it an honor to serve you. And our prayer is that the service was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. If you were impacted today by the preaching of God's Word, we encourage you to respond. If we can pray with you, or if you would like to make a decision today for Christ, please call us here at 704-327-5662. We have people waiting right now on the lines prepared to help you. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to welcome you again soon. Have a wonderful week.